no one had any power over myself. I didn't give them that power. I don't care what the naysayers were saying or what they believe. And a lot of folks normally, you know, trying to spill on the, what they, their negativity that they have among themselves and hopefully that you'll be influenced by it. And I, and I don't really give anybody that power. So hopefully they get that from that movie, knowing that I was a confident kid and I didn't care what anybody think. And I saw it all the way through. So the first question I want to ask you is, what do you think is different about you versus the tens of thousands of guys, let's say, who loved playing basketball, loved the game of basketball, but thought, I'm just not tall enough, so it's not going to happen for me. Why bother? Well, I think as a small guy, I, I accept it what I was and who I am and in terms of how I need to play the game. And I think a lot of us at a undersized, we play the game a little different. We try to play it like the bigger player, like they should play it. But at my position, I knew the responsibility with it all came with it in terms of making guys around you better, being able to be an extension of the coach, having that responsibility of making guys and as well as being able to to, to, to survive and, and do things positively yourself on the basketball court. And defensively, uh, just being a pest, make sure that they have to work getting the basketball across the half court because the point guard is the, is the guy that really starts it all. And if you can disrupt him and make it difficult on his, on his behalf at the beginning of it, I mean, it gives you a better chance of just being noticed and being out there. And I understood the game. I think my knowledge and people, I think, didn't really understand that the IQ level that I had on that basketball court, but my peers did. And I think that separated me from a lot of the small guards that try to pursue this game and make it try to play it to the highest level, which was the NBA. But I want to talk to you about the power of belief because I was actually listening to your book, your memoir over the last few days, and your childhood was, was not a bed of roses. You had a lot of challenges and you it, it's sort of like you were you are one of those people I remember when the movie The Secret came out in 2006 and now the power of belief and the law of attraction is in our zeitgeist right but back then it was not but you had it in spades where did that come from I think my upbringing you know where I came from as you alluded to growing up in the inner city of Baltimore I think the trauma that I went through early on being shot at five and when I used to go on the basketball court and hearing all the negative words, you know, you're too small, why are you pursuing this game? It really used to impact me. It really had a major impact on, on my confidence. I think after that dramatic experience, you know, I didn't think anything was devastating. It definitely wasn't words. And it just gave me the confidence and the belief that to pursue what I was dreaming, what I believed in. And luckily for me, I, my blessing, you know, I met, in our neighborhood by Mr. Leon Howard. And by him giving me the information on how to navigate, how to play the game and preparation, it, it allowed me to continue to believe in myself and the confidence and knowing that I was going to grow and didn't get worried about my height. I just didn't care about what anybody thought. I let all that negative energy come in one end, go out the other. And I stayed on my path, on my journey, just believing what I wanted. And I knew that if I can have confidence with myself, it will rub off on others. And that's where it, it all stems from. Did you ever hear what, do you know who the actor Michael Rappaport is? Yes. Did you ever hear his quote about you? Well, I, he sent me his book. <laughs> he loves you. He thinks yeah. you are the greatest thing since sliced bread. I saw him on, he was doing, I don't want to get this wrong. He was doing the Rich Eisen show. And he was actually talking to Rex Chapman about mm. you. And my... you're a former teammate. Mm -hmm. And he said, Muggsy Bogues is one of the most iconic players. He's five foot three and he played in the league for I think 15 fucking years. Actually it's 14 fucking years. <laughs> but he said, why is Muggsy Bogues not doing TED talks and doing motivational speaking? Because when you think of outside the line thinkers and somebody with a powerful brain who overcame things, it's Muggsy Bogues. 
Well, I really appreciate him saying those kind of words for me. And, and it all comes from just believing in, as we talk about, believing in yourself. And I always make sure that, you know, when I speak to kids, and I do a lot of speaking engagement, a lot of talks, and I always want to let them know that it always starts within. It starts with them. You know, the, the confidence within yourself. When you look yourself in that mirror and don't like that reflection, you really love it because that's what God had created. Uh, we all get a special gift. And we all need to understand, you know, hopefully we can find that gift sometime. Don't even, you know, locate that special gift that God had created. And I always tell the kids and anyone who's, you know, I come in contact with, it starts with you. It starts with confidence. If you don't have it, then it's very difficult for anybody to kind of believe within you what you're trying to spell out. Do you believe that we all plan our life before we incarnate? into this life do you do you subscribe to that at all uh in some sort i think we do because subconsciously the things that we think the things that we believe you know we start taking actions behind them and those actions sometimes always lead to that that you know that thought subconsciousness that has been you know already been been planted for you and and i always truly believed in that and and i always kind of go with that because you know, that's the feeling and that's something that, you know, you can't second guess. And God sits before we all have it, before we all even, you know, think of sometimes people will be doing things and and go and as we go to school, we, a lot of folks go to school and get degrees and normally you get a job outside of that, which you go to school for. And, and you wonder why is that, you know, and that's come back to, you know, that thing that, you know, that carnation thing that may have been always set for you that you haven't even envisioned. And that, that yeah. was always. Yeah. So I have a question about <laughs> uh, I, what I heard was that there were two players you had trouble guarding throughout your career. Do you know who I'm going to say? Oh, I, I, I'm curious. Okay. So what people have said, I think it was actually Rex who said this, that the only two players you had trouble guarding were Gary Payton and Magic Johnson. Is that true? Well, one of them for sure, yes. Which one for sure? Uh, Magic was one of them. And Gary, I'll, I'll give it to Gary too, because Gary was, it was he ran for because of what the way he played the game. But it was more or less Magic, uh, because Magic liked the pass out of the post. And because of his size, of course, 6'9". But I had the ability to play a bigger guard and play him well with his back towards the basket. But normally... They're not accustomed to playing that way. But Magic was totally different because he had the ability to, to see guys, you know, peripheral out of his, uh, from behind his head, and he can be able to do things basketball. And uh, and it caused me a lot of problems. Gary Payton, it wasn't so much, but it was a lot of battles between Gary and I. So I, I can understand why Rex went with Gary as well. Okay. And I want to talk about your sister, Sharon. Sharon. Sharon, I'm sorry. You credit her with introducing you to the game of basketball? Absolutely. Tell me yeah. about that. Well, she was my biggest, my oldest sister, and she was small stature as well. And my sister was fearless. I mean, she played all sorts of sports. She played baseball, football, as well as basketball. And by me being small and seeing her tenaciousness and her, you know, competitiveness going out there competing against the boys, it just made me want to go out there and play and not be fearless at it as well. And seeing how she was having success out there against them and gave me that energy that, you know, my sister could do it, then I can do it. So that will, that's what really introduced me and what wanted me to really get out there to pursue it. Was she passionate sp uh, specifically about basketball? Very passionate about basketball. And even, you know, when I played and of course, I continue to, to, to keep climbing the ladders and played in college as well as in the NBA. And she's always at the game, hollering behind me in the bench. Shorty, shoot the ball, do this, do that. So she's always, you know, I loved her for that because that's where you get your true criticism from the ones yeah. that love. Yeah. And when you were during your time with the Hornets, you and Del Curry became very, very close, like family. And yeah, and, and your kids, your kids grew up together. They were also very close. And you, you would tell stories about 
Stephen Curry and Seth Curry and kind of, you know, playing with them in the locker room and watching them. I, you knew them from the time they were toddlers, right? Yeah, they, uh, we, our family grew up with one another, the Currys and the Vogues. And Dell and I, you know, we literally played 11 years with each other throughout my 14 years of uh, in the NBA, nine in Charlotte and two in, in Toronto. And Stephen and our kids grew up and, and being around the game. And Stephen and Seth especially, you know, they were just like little sponges, just soaking up all that information. You know, I I recall they have a video of me giving Stephen a little airplane ride in, in our locker room when he was small. But he, he was just such a joy, him and Seth both, um, just watching them. And no one even knew uh, they would turn out to be the type of players that they are today. I mean, even in high school, you know, they were so scrawny and skinny and small, and they all compared them kind of like me, but they were just a little taller, but just slender. And uh, no one even gave them the credit, but to see them now and see how they transform themselves and, and not only just on the court, but off the court, I'm so proud of the both of them, the way they was able to, you know, grow and become young men and become men and now raising their families and doing it in a very special way. So it's an honor to watch it. Did Stefan look up to you kind of because you also did not have the typical stature of a basketball player? And he was, he was, was it like he was only five, six in high school and he was kind of skinny. He had a narrow build. So did he no. kind of look to you as an example of somebody who could really succeed in the game, even though you didn't have that traditional large player build? Yeah, he did. He, I mean, he looked at me early on and he seen that a guy that's five foot three that's playing, you know, on a day to day basis and, and out there having success. And that's something that he always hung his head on as well. He always said that I won his favorite best players. So that always gave me a little chill to knowing that. But it just, you know, for a kid like that to be around me at that, you know, length of time and, and seeing, you know, me able to, you know, navigate throughout all the the, the, the nonsense that was being said. And mm -hmm. Sammy had, it just, you know, allowed him to, to see it firsthand. And he always alluded to that. And, you know, and him and Seth both, for them being able to, uh, you know, not hear the, that noise that they were hearing about themselves and not believing, they stayed on that path and they continue. And I'm just loving, you know, and, you know, what I'm witnessing to this day. And I want to talk about Dunbar High School because, I mean, so few players make it to the NBA. So to have so many players on your high school team who made it into, I mean, I don't, that, I don't know what the chances are. It's like, that's like a long shot on top of a long shot. I mean, like, do, do you credit your coach at high school? Do you just think it was just one of those serendipitous things that were just destined to happen? I mean, how do you explain the Dunbar High School phenomenon? Um, we was fortunate enough to have a great coach like Coach Wade, but we had some good people in our circles. You know, we all grew up, you know, in the, in the area. It's not like it today where people recruiting these type of players and bringing them all together from different cities and making, you know, one special team. We all lived in the area, which was the school was right across from our street. But coach, you know, he just had the, you know, that leadership quality. You know, he knew how to check those egos at the door. And for us to be able to, you know, go in and accomplish the thing we was able to accomplish for the two years that I was there, being 59 and 0, and, you know, being considered one of the best teams that ever been assembled. And for four of us to be able to make it all the way to the NBA and three of us, you know, making history in 87, getting drafted. You know, in the same, in the first round, you know, and me, myself, Reggie Williams, and the late Reggie Laws. So that was, that was, a, you know, a blessing within itself. And having all of us be, go to a Division One school, you know, you got to give that credit to Coach Wade, you know, because he was the one that, you know, had that empathetic ear, understanding of where we came from. You know, he was all accountable. He made sure he gave us vision. But more importantly, you know, we was all grateful and had that gratitude to be with one another. There's a moment between you and Michael Jordan that gets talked about a lot. And there are images of you trying to guard him and him kind of taunting you, holding the ball up, way up so that you couldn't get it. And, you know, and trash talking you and all of that stuff. Do you think that he actually was thrown off by the fact that he couldn't play the way that he would normally play 
when he was playing against you. Because, because of the difference in height, he knew that you played in a way that he wasn't accustomed to. Like I always say to my son, because he's a basketball player, and right now he's only 5'5", five five, and he's he's doing everything he can to try to grow, like every supplement, every. And I'm like, I'm like, just relax, just play the game. But what I say to him all the time is I'm like, the taller players are trees, right? And you're like a bush. So you need to play the game close to the floor. Because when the guy is dribbling and he's looking straight ahead, he's not going to see you coming, right? Absolutely. And, and that's and that, how I you play. Go ahead. Yeah. No, and that's exactly right. And that's why Michael... As you listen to one of his interviews on the internet, he always said that he always had trouble playing against the smaller guys, myself, Damon Stoudemire, Allen Iverson, and Rod Strickland. You know, because when you're smaller, the ball is closer to you because of when the guy's dribbling the basketball, because the ball, they got to dribble on the ground. And having that understanding, that's one of the things that I understood how to play down low and how to affect them down low and how to make them think about their dribbles uh, because that's where it all starts. And uh, I used to count my, I used to time the guys dribble because once the ball goes down, they mm -hmm. can't stop it. And that's why I used to shoot the gap and, and steal it quite a bit. So for your son to bands five, five, just tell them, you know, don't worry about being getting taller, just keep being aggressive and just keep being that pest and pick up your guy at the beginning when they first get it 94 feet don't wait till they come half court because guards like that cushion they don't like that in your face all day long and that wears them down and that kind of gives them you know that envision that 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 that, that vision that man he's a pest he's out here all day long and that starts to wear on them yeah. and that gives you the edge of being out there and being effective on their head so that's why you gotta I always say that when you play against the best if you have success against the best then you now be included with the best. Yeah. And so then in 96, you were cast in Space Jam. <laughs> and I knew, I knew that you knew that was coming. So did Michael, there were five other NBA players cast opposite Michael. Did he do the casting or was it a production decision to put you in the movie? Well, we all had the same agent. David Fault was out. Myself, Patrick Yeoman, Michael, as well as Sean Bradley. But I think when they was all putting together, I don't know who all did the casting, but it all worked out. It all fit. I think the characters that they chose all worked out. Believe it or not, I was hurt. I had surgery during, the, during that shooting of the movie where I didn't think I was going to be in it. Uh, but they had me come and read my lines anyway. I think they had Tim Hardaway as well, but they went on with me. Actually, you can see me kind of actually look like I was walking. They had me pull it and my shoulders were just moving where we was walking. I was yeah. Walking. Yeah. Yeah. I read that moment in the book, and then I recognized it when I when I saw the way that they shot that scene. That was actually pretty funny. And you're funny. Like you're a good comedic actor. You're really funny. Was that uh, your first movie? Well, no, that wasn't my first one. I did Hang Time. Well, that was my first movie. Yes, that I did a TV show called Hang Time with Anthony Anderson when he first started out in his acting career. But uh, yeah, I that. Space Jam was my very first movie. Yes, it was. Okay. Okay. And did you, when you first got recruited into the NBA, you attended training camp with Scottie Pippen, correct? Well, no. Scotty and I, we had, before we got drafted, he and I got invited to the um, tournament, the, the Portsmouth tournament. And he, myself was considered to be headed in the late second round, early first round. And Scotty was projected to go late first round as well. And because of our performance at Portsmouth and then uh, Chicago, our stock had ro risen up to where he was number six and I was drafted 12. Okay. And what was he like to play with? Oh, Scotty was unbelievable. I mean, because of his length and because of the way I like to play the game, he loved to play defense as well. I mean, uh -huh. we were forming everybody. We was trapping. We was getting out in the fast break. It was a lot of fun playing with Scotty Pittman on that wing. Are there any guys in the league that you wish you could have had the experience of either playing or being on the same team on that you didn't get the opportunity to? 
I think a guy like Michael, I would have loved to play with Michael. I mean, um, having having him on that wing and his ability and all the things he was able to do, and that have been fun for me. Yeah. Did things like did I mean? I'm assuming your relationship with him kind of smoothed over the years. Oh well, I mean, there's always been a great relationship. It, it, I mean, we never had no where it, it took a you know a, a dive in terms of the negative. No, we always been pretty good good friends and competitors. You know, you know, we go way back from college days. And I want to ask you about you have a very unique situation because you married your wife twice. Yes. You actually you remarried again, right? You're not just together, you're you're remarried. So yes. what is that like? What is the difference between your marriage to Kim the first time around versus the second time around? I'm more smarter the second time around as opposed to the first time around. We was young, you know, that first when we was married, when we got married the first time, I was twenty-four, she was twenty-two. We just said we had our first kid, and then I had my oldest daughter had moved in with us, and then my son. So we had three kids. It was it was like a, I was she was thrust upon three kids, and, and within one year, and uh, and that was a challenge for us. But you know, we grew once we was apart as well. I mean, I loved, I always loved her, the mother of my kids. And for us to be able to reunite and, you know, that's not normally with in relationships where you kind of do it the second time with the same person. But, you know, fortunate enough for me and her, you know, we able to do it again and do it the right way. And this mm -hmm. is more special and especially it makes the family, the kids even excited that we had, you know, we can do it. We found ourselves well way back with one another. It just makes the family that much as a whole. And, and I'm grateful and thankful that I have this second opportunity with her because that's how I'd always should start when you, you know, when you give your, you know, you have, you know, you walk down the aisle and you give that testimony to the man upstairs. And so if, to, I'm just happy again. I'm thankful. Yeah. And yeah. what would you say, like, would you say that the wife of an NBA player is, is a difficult life or, or, I mean, you know, it's because a lot of people, it looks like a privileged life, right? But at the same time, I was listening to, I was watching an old clip of Kobe Bryant doing an interview and he was talking about being away from home nine months out of the year and his wife, Vanessa, home with all the kids and, and, and taking care of everything. I mean, like, what, you know, what, how, 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 what do you think the experience is? from what you've seen being married to a professional athlete for a woman? It's a challenge on both parts. I mean, for a woman as well, cause they're the one that's at home, taking care of the kids, keeping the home and, and, and man, and then there those responsibilities that a home should be able to continue to tend to. And then the person that's on the road and whatever that craft is and whatever they're out there doing, it comes back with the trust factor and, and understanding even when we're apart, we still together. And hopefully, you know, temptations don't, you know, lead you down the wrong path and the flesh doesn't get more beyond the, what the mind should be, you know, headed towards and, and thinking about more importantly, it's what's at home. And when you're younger, I don't want to just put it on a youth because it all depends on how strong you are as an individual. Because right. I've young individual just, you know, awarded and not and stay away from those temptations. And they understand the importance of, what their valves are, what they have at home. And I just credit that until, you know, just a part of a man and a woman that's growing, a uh, growth. And hopefully that they understand that part and knowing that you, even though you are separated, that you still have that mindset, that trust factor, that your partner's trusting you as well as you trusting them to maintain mm -hmm. the type of connection that you guys share with one another. And Again, it's tough because especially when you around it and as athletes and so much things are thrown upon you and, and you got to be, again, strong enough to know that it is, that's it's just a matter of time and just a waste of time more than anything. 
and it's not a, that much that it's that serious to be throwing away what is so important that you got at home. True. And do you pray? And if so, who or what do you pray to? I pray to the man upstairs. I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. I have a strong faith and he guides me. And that's one reason I am here today. And one reason why I was able to you know, do the things that I was able to do because of his guidance and because of you know, the direction that he always had me in, in headed. And when a movie is made one day about your life, which I suspect that it will be at some point, what do you hope and pray that they get right? Well, how humble and how appreciated I am in terms of the help that I got along the way and just the, just the confidence that I have within. You know, it's not cockiness, not being egotistic and just being confident and believing that anything is possible, whatever you set your mind to. And no one has the ability to make change in any different besides yourself. And I always, like I tell my kids, you know, I always tell them, you can do what you want to do. You can be what you want to be. The only person stopping me is me. And, you know, that resonate with them. And that's something that I always believed in because no one had any power over myself. I didn't give them that power. I don't care what the naysayers were saying or what they believe. And a lot of folks normally, you know, trying to spill on the, what they, their negativity that they have among themselves and hopefully that you'll be influenced by it. And I, and I don't really give anybody that power. So hopefully they get that from that movie, knowing that I was a confident kid and I didn't care what anybody think. And I saw it all the way through. Do you ever envision or have you ever had an idea of who you would want to play you? Like, are there any actors out there that you ever think about and you think, oh my God, that guy could play me or no? I haven't think of any guys out there because no one is, it's hard to find someone that's small, that plays basketball and yeah. that fit that. You know, I always say Kevin Hart, but Kevin Hart too dark. You know, he, he, he he's not like <laughs> No, <laughs> it would have to be an unknown, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I got be... <laughs> the little kid from uh, what's that? Underground Railroad, Dylan. Underground Railroad. Oh, that was a television show with Journey Smollett, right? Yeah, I think the little kid name was Dylan, I believe. Oh, now I have to look at that. Yeah, I think okay. that's he might he might could pull it off. The younger version, maybe. Yeah, you have you have anyone out there? You got any? Any thoughts? In my, in my play you? Yeah, what about your son? He's five, five. <laughs> you know what's funny? My son is a spitting image of Miles Morales. You know the character Miles Morales, Spider-Man? So spitting I know my image. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about the, the Muggsy Bogues Family Foundation. And is it run by your daughter, Brittany? Well, she's the vice president. And I have an uh, executive director as well, of, of course, board members and so forth. But it's the Muggsy Bow Family Foundation, and it's something that we're, we're so passionate about to be able to serve the Charlotte community. You know, our vision is to empower the, the underserved and the youth and their families to live a better quality life through food insecurity, education, and workforce development. And uh, we also have a scholarship program where we had partnered with CPCC here that will they oversee our scholarship for kids to go to a to, to a, a trade school who have ambition in that as at that you know industry to further their careers. I know a lot of people focus on the four year university, but I wanted to focus on you know this trade bound tradition uh, schools that is could really just go right to work job ready after they finish debt free. And they pay great salaries in these type of fields. And I just wanted to bring some attention to that and, and give them opportunity to, you know, to where they can, you know, benefit themselves as well as their families. And this is all work you're doing with within the state of North Carolina? Yes. It's Charlotte, North Carolina. Yes. North Carolina. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you ever do anything with your with your high school, your old alma mater, Dunbar? It 
we have done some things. I do some, I go back in Baltimore every year. I put on a tournament for my sister because you know, she had passed in 2015 and the city had proclaimed her a day on June 27th. So we go back every year and I put on a tournament for the boys and the girls, football and basketball, because that was the youth program that she ran back in the city of Baltimore. Okay. So we have a community event every year and, and we had one this past June 27th where the community came out and really celebrated her. And um, I was so thankful for them, for their support and Park and Rec who partnered with us as well, uh, lend their support. And it turned out to be really good. The, the kids really benefited as, as well as the city and the community. So it was a fun day. And uh, those are the things that we do back in Baltimore. Unfortunately, we haven't lately done anything with Dunbar. They going through different changes. Hopefully, you know, when all unsettled, we can get back to, you know, providing back for the school that always allowed me to bleed maroon and gold. Mm -hmm. And do you have either a superstition, a quirky personality trait, or something about you that people do not know and would be very surprised to find out? Um, cookies. Is there anything, anything you do, like any superstition or any, anything that you do that maybe people wouldn't be aware of or anything like that? That's what I'm trying to think. I don't do anything out there. I'm just so simple. I'm just <laughs> a guy that, you know, love playing golf, come home, we travel, love eating Twizzlers. I'm a candy nut. I love my candy. You yeah. like the, stra the strawberry Twizzlers, like the regular red ones, right? Strawberry, the strawberry, yes. I don't like the cherry ones. I like the strawberry ones. You know, the other ones, not the plastic ones, you know, got to be strawberry. Do yeah. you ever drink? Do you ever drink water out of, do you ever make a straw out of it and drink water up to it? Who doesn't drink out of it? You got to put a little hold in it sometimes just because <laughs> that's with it a little bit. I don't eat the black licorices though, but just the, just the strawberry. But yeah, you got to cut the hold sometimes, you know, and I does it and crazy. This may be crazy. Sometimes I have my cocktail and I will take my Twizzler and use it as a straw. So that could be something that weird or kinky that people can. <laughs> what is your cocktail of choice? Jack Daniels and a ginger ale. And okay. then some, mostly then if not, then I have me a nice little red wine, glass of red wine. Okay, so you sit there with your Jack Daniels and ginger ale with your Twizzler straw. I would, like yeah. <laughs> sometimes that happens. Sometimes that happens. Yeah. What do you think you came into this life as Muggsy Bogues to learn? And what do you think you came here to teach people? I came, I think I came in to learn how the world operates and how people are all different in their own ways. And I see that. And I think I've came in the world to teach people that we all could be different, but at the same time, not be hateful and not be divisive. And we all can get along as well as we can accomplish with all we choose to once we believe, you know, within ourselves. And hopefully that during my time on this earth that I can display those type of characteristics, those type of effectiveness amongst people and where they can see that we treat everybody the same, regardless of what color of our skin or who we are, what gender we are. Would you say that you are a living, breathing example of the fact that anything is possible? Absolutely. Absolutely. 1000%. 1000. Because I know I went against the odds and went against the grain and uh, being the smallest who ever do it. I mean, it's all within that man upstairs and with his understanding, his faith, the guidance and, you know, being a testament of him and having that confidence that you can be whoever you want. I mean, I will always say yes. Thank you for a great interview. I really appreciate it.
Oh, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed this. Of course, of course. All right, blessings to you and take care. Thank you. Okay, take care. Have a good day. You can listen to this entire episode and other interviews of mine by going to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and downloading and subscribing to the Allison Interviews podcast.